I've got some OC for you. All true. And what I have written, word for word, is exactly that. A few years back, when my parents had left the military, my father had trouble looking for work. We eventually moved into a lodge that my grandparents managed in the Northwest in order to make things work. As it turns out, the month we move in, a job opportunity for my father and large house right near my school. Mind you, the drive to my school from the lodge was 45 minutes and becoming a strain on funds became available. A few months passed and the only thing we really had complaints about with the home was the windows. At all times in this house was it freezing and the power bill to crank the heat high enough to keep us warm was ridiculous. So, naturally, we began bundling up with extra blankets at night and staying together in the same room during dinner with TV, etc. A note from here. At this time, we had two dogs, a hunting hound for my father and a dachshund for me. The hound was nice, but more of a tool, while the dachshund was the family pet. Every night, this little wiener dog would hop up on my lap, do a few circles, then sleep between my ankles, using either foot as a headrest. I loved the little guy. One day, toward the end of our stay in the home, we noticed some odd things, the most prominent of which was that during dinner, my father mentioned loving how the dachshund kept his feet warm some nights, that night in particular. I responded that I loved that as well, but he must have been mistaken. I had kept my door closed after my dog came into my room, and my parents did as well. We passed it off as one of us was mistaken. The same night, I left the door open as the dog had gone up to my parents' bedroom, and I hoped they would open it by going to the bathroom or otherwise, and that he would return to me. Around 2.20ish that morning, I heard the little chatter of dog's nails on the tile in the hallway, followed by the soft padding feet on the shag carpeting, then felt the small dog hop up onto the bed and eventually come to rest between my feet. I remember smiling, feeling his warmth, then going to sleep. The next morning, I woke for school just before my father left for work and noticed my dog was gone. A little confused, I asked my father about it, whom informed me that the dog had joined him that night. We exchanged our looks, but again, played it off as misremembering. Before I left for school, I saw that the dog had been left out that night in the backyard. With this, I suspected something was horribly wrong. By this, I mean I was tearing with fear as to what was happening. I was certain I had felt the dog, as was my dad, and yet he had stayed outside that night. I told my mother, who, obviously, did not believe me. Later, I brought it up with my father. I remember him honestly showing some concern over it and offering a proposal. He said, look, we'll leave the dog in your room, lock your door, and we'll see if something happens. That night, I did as he asked and locked my door with the little dog in my room. We promptly fell asleep and woke up the next morning with little issue. When I opened my door, I found my father in the living room, talking on the phone to what sounded like our pastor from church. The day following the pastor's visit went uninterrupted, and it seemed that whatever was happening was pacified. No strange feelings, no sounds, no vanishing dogs. Everything seemed normal. At this point, my mother and I noticed that the house was getting colder, but I remember my father calling us wussies and saying if I ever wanted to go hunting with him, I need to get a little more used to the cold. A week later, the dog things began happening again. We would hear the nails, then the footsteps, then the jump, and finally the dog resting. I became so scared that I started locking my door, which did nothing to stop the happenings. One night, when I felt the dog jump into my lap, I flipped on my dresser light only to hear a door slam down the hall. I never did this again. We decided to take a vacation from the home to get some perspective and release some tension. We went to visit family and snowboard for a while. When we got back, we found my little dachshund mutilated in the backyard. His chest had been covered in puncture wounds and his legs were broken. Mind you, he was not dead. We brought him to the vet and they were able to patch him up, but they needed to keep him for a couple of weeks. The happenings occurred nightly throughout this time. The day we brought him home, he seemed so happy, excited. We played with him and gave him table scraps. We were just happy he made it through 
whatever happened. That night, we found the dog in the backyard again, with the same wounds. Only this time, he did not make it. He had bled all over the yard and was laying out on a scrap of cardboard, as if delivered to us. I shit you not, this was the most horrified and sad I had ever been. From here on, we did not feel the dog on our lap, hear the chatter in the hall, nor that familiar shag carpet sound. Only silence. Believe it or not, this is where things get really weird. My brother, at this time six, began talking to an imaginary friend in his room. He would not talk to us about it, but we could hear him through the door. He would talk about extremely vulgar things, and we could hear my brother saying that the things were bad and that he would go to hell for saying them. I quote this next part. So what do you like to do anyway? Silence. You should not say things like that. My mama says that Jesus doesn't like them. Silence. Oh. Silence. Okay, I'll see you later then. At this point, we opened the door and found my brother staring into his open closet. We asked him who he was talking to, but he only responded, my friend in the closet. He won't let me say anything else. We duct taped the closet shut. I don't know if I mentioned this, but most all of these happenings only happened at night, either right before we went to bed or around two-ish. We began sleeping in the living room together, my mom and dad on the couches, my brother and I in sleeping bags on the floor nearby. In the center of our room was a small kerosene furnace that kept us warm, as at this time it had begun to get so cold we could not keep warm with blankets alone. Things began happening separately to the family. My brother would wake up in his room and we would find him in front of the closet with the duct tape peeled back or missing altogether. I would hear footsteps down the hallway towards the garage and hear an elderly male voice beckoning me. My mother would hear a young man's voice whispering my father's name at her and my father's head of the couch and my father would see figures in the shadows watching us. I would cry myself to sleep often and as I type this, my own fear is making my eyes water a bit. We had another pastor come in to bless our home, but once he stepped into the door, he looked at the stairs to the second floor where my brother's room was, and said that it was evil, and that we needed to leave as soon as humanly possible, and then he left. A few nights later, everything stopped. The moment of respite continued for almost a week before I began experiencing it again. I began hearing a soft whisper from down the hallway. I did not understand the voice, but a voice alone kept me from walking towards the end of the house until daybreak. Basically, our family would hole up in the living room from sunset to daybreak, where everything seemed normal. My parents began to think that the entire ordeal was over and thought it would be best if we all returned to our rooms and forget that anything ever happened. I told them about the voice, and the idea immediately fell through. At night, I'd wake up, at what I assume was two-ish, since my clock was in my room, and I refused to go back and get it. It was about eight feet from the garage door, where I heard the voices, to hear the voices again. They'd say things like, come closer, then laugh, mockingly, or please come here, there's something I want to show you, then stifle a giggle. I remember one dream at this time, where I had come face to face with a large horn shadow held out a blackened silhouette of my house to me, and when I touched it, I became so cold, frightened, and tormented that I woke up and literally pissed myself while screaming in pain. My family began looking for a new home. Finally, one afternoon, the family was getting prepared for the night, snacks near the furnace, blankets and pillows ready, and the TV to keep our thoughts occupied. I got up to go to the bathroom. It was only around 4 in the afternoon, so we had at least a few hours of daylight left. As I walked into the bathroom, I heard the voice again, and it made me freeze. I'm here, it whispered. It was in the same fucking hall I was. I felt literally paralyzed. I heard footsteps from behind me, and felt chilled as they passed, leading to the garage. Come on, you little pussy, it whispered. I could not do anything, and for a moment... I thought about simply screaming and collapsing, perhaps hoping it would take pity on a little crying boy. The voice laughed again. Suddenly, with a feeling of overwhelming desperation, I ran to the garage and opened the door 
and leapt into the cold. There, I screamed out loud. All I heard was laughter. The kind of laughter where your sides hurt and you can't catch your breath. I felt horrified, humiliated, and alone. My parents, hearing the scream, ran down the hall and found me crying in the garage. The voice began to turn gruff and elderly from here. I know I'm dragging on, so I'll finish up here soon. I recognized it as an old man, but now it did not sound menacing. It sounded pleading. My brother said that he heard the voices too, but I did not care. The begging and crying was starting to drive me insane. All it would say was, Please, help an old man. Or, I'm so sorry, I could not handle it. That weekend, my grandfather, still running the lodge, fell out of a tree while trimming branches away from the lodge sign and broke most of his ribs and his back. The chainsaw, my grandfather told me, landed just a foot or two away and that it was a miracle he did not die. Last bit. I was the first to bring up the similarity to our dog from just a few weeks ago and how the situations were the same. We moved into a friend's home that night. Now, we live just a few miles away in our own home. Since that day, we haven't had any strange incidents, but I still have nightmares, awful bouts of depression, and dreams of taking my own life on common occasion. Sometimes I see a man killing my family while I sit on the floor in my sleeping bag, dumbfounded, next to the couches my parents slept on. Let me tell you this. Please do not fuck with shit like this. I would give anything, anything, not to have moved in that house. It's messed with my head so much, I can't begin to explain how I feel after another nightmare. Hope you had your fill X. I sure have. So X, I'm from Germany. We have tales about doppelgangers. Don't know if it's the same, but it sounds just like that. Anyways, I live in the south of Germany near Schwarzwald. Been camping there since childhood with friends and their families, usually annually or every second year. Here and there I remember our parents being kind of worried about something, but it was never something big. Sometimes there were weird voices in the forest, but hey, it's not a city after all. Now I'm 21 and we still go camping there. Nowadays, without our parents though. Last year, I had a creepy encounter I want to tell you about. Go to usual camping site with four buddies. Set up cams on the same place. Pumped up because everyone is always looking forward to this event. Celebrate first night at campfire with alcohol. One buddy stumbles away to take a piss. He's one of those men who can't pee with others around, so he goes deep in the woods. Comes back talking about some other campfire. We laugh at him and assume he just saw ours from afar. Blame it on the alcohol, and he gets convinced. Eventually take care of the fire, and go to sleep hammered. Wonderful morning, with headache follows a peaceful night. We enjoy our stay, and go swimming in a nearby river. Get back to our camp, and one friend hurries out of his tent. Someone went for his backpack. His stuff is spread all over his sleeping bag. Shirt and phone are missing. Go to check my tent, and find my backpack empty too. Get alarmed and assume a thief. Everyone searches for their valuable goods, such as expensive lights, money, and phones. Everything is there. Only friend's shirt and phone is missing. Decide to look for footprints and find a trail in the coal leading into the woods. No boot prints, but actual bare feet. Oh shit. All of us decide not to stay there, and we pack our stuff. Take some time to get equipment back in our cars. Suddenly, our friend's phone starts to ring. Guys, you should see this. Fuck. We went up to him to see that the stolen phone is calling. Robbed friend gets angry, takes the phone and answers. Listen, that's not funny. Stops talking abruptly. Pale as a ghost. Turns on the speaker. Someone is talking slowly, like a mad baby in the voice of friend's dad. Everyone's stunned, scared, and puzzled at the same time. Bravest one of us snaps out of it, takes the phone, and shouts at dad. Dad hangs up. Dead silence all over the camping site. Let's call him to find this fucker and get the phone back, bravest one suggests. Nobody really stops him, 
so he starts dialing. Hear it ringing in the forest. Ringing, coming nearer. We get together, grabbing knives and a shovel. See a shadow standing in the forest. Friend's dad calls out to us. Comes out and looks just like him, only wearing his son's shirt and nothing else. Opens mouth and out comes gibberish again. We attack him and he runs into the forest, screaming like a madman. Decide to stay together and follow him. He runs towards an open field with a dead fireplace. Drops the phone and vanishes behind trees. We pick it up and see other shadows coming from his direction. There are eight in total, all trying to form words. Now hear my parents' voice. Fear now rules our minds. Book it back to our camp, get in cars, and fucking hurry out of the forest while calling the police. Did not find anything but friend's shirt. We talk with our parents about it. They panicked and told us that on some of the many pictures, you can see shades watching from the woods. They'd also see somebody in two places at the same time, although that was not possible. Until that day, they put it up as bullshit, but now that has changed. Some of us are in therapy and nobody believes us. We never went back there. Here is one without a punchline. I never did figure out exactly what was going on. Several years ago, I went down to Guatemala. It's not important why. The only thing you need to know is that me and a few others were going to be meeting one-on-one -on -one with a bunch of locals over about two weeks. Me and a colleague, she's not important. I discover early on that many of the women we talk to are scared to go to the hospital. Try to figure out why, but locals will not say. Make a note of it and move on. We were on a tight schedule. I don't forget about it, though. Going forward, I make a point of gauging how everyone feels about the hospital. It's clear that they are uncomfortable talking about it. This is ringing alarm bells in my head because it's very pertinent to why I'm here in the first place. Anyway, there is a local doctor I'm in close contact with. Call him Dr. Gomez. He works at the hospital in question. Second day of my arrival, I meet up with him. I tell him what I'm hearing so far. Now, most of you reading this will think these are ignorant peasants. They're probably just scared of modern medicine. But take it from someone who works closely with Central American rural farmers and villagers all the time. That's just a cliche. Many are deeply superstitious, of course. But they're not scared of modern medicine. They just think modern treatments are less effective than herbal remedies. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is... Dr. Gomez actually tries to sell me on this ignorant peasant bullshit. Not in those words. This sets off more alarm bells. It's a very strange thing for a doctor to say about his own community. Now I am suspicious. Not just of the hospital, but of Dr. Gomez as well. I keep this to myself. The next day, I'm meeting with locals again. FYI, my colleague and I are moving down a list of families. We're about a quarter of the way down this list by the third day. The first few people that we meet with express the same wariness about the hospital that the others did. Again, they will not really say why. About halfway through the day, everything changes. Anytime I bring up the hospital, people sing its praises. It's like that for the entire rest of the day. I'm puzzled. What do I make of this turn of events? Decide to follow a hunch. The next day I backtrack. My colleague continues moving down the list, meeting with locals, while I revisit a few families that we've already talked to. Suddenly, all of those people are changing their tune. I mentioned that they expressed concerns about the hospital before. They deny it. I become more direct, reading from my notes. They still deny it. Then it hits me. They're all parroting the same thing. It's like someone's been coaching them. Fuck. I guess I've got to tell you a bit more about why I was there to explain the next part. So I was sent down to Guatemala because there's an obesity and diabetes epidemic down there. Local government was working jointly with doctors and scientists to develop a nutritional guideline. Nobody follows it. Government is perplexed. I was brought in here 
to have a roundtable discussion with the local scientific community to work on resolving what they regarded as a cultural issue. Dr. Gomez was one of the participants in the discussion. All participants were provided with a list that my colleague and I would use in conducting our interviews with the locals. So, Dr. Gomez had this list. I thought about his suspicious hand-waving and the fact that roughly after I'd spoken with him, everyone began changing their story. Realize I'm about to be totally stonewalled if I don't do something. So I decided to go off script. I jumped to the end of the list. Visit a family living at the outer edges of the village. When I get there, I see Dr. Gomez leaving. He doesn't even notice me because he's holding the damn list, reading through it. But he looks up and his reaction confirms my suspicions. Surprise. Concern. Anger. But he plays it off quickly. Tells me he's surprised to see me out here already. I ask him what he's doing. Making a house call. I ask what about. Physician patient privilege. He tells me very curtly that he has to go. I decide to go ahead and talk with the family. I find the wife alone. Of course, she does not tell me anything. She's obviously scared, but when I bring it up, she says she does not feel well. So I ask if she wants me to take her to the hospital. I see panic in her eyes as she tells me, no, no, no. She just has a headache or something. Keep in mind, she's acting like this after pretty much parroting. Something's going on here and it's getting buried. I can feel it. That night, I'm in my room, staying in a small house with my colleague. I'm thinking through my interviews and looking through my notes. It's very late and I should be in bed when I hear footsteps outside my window. I glance outside, but no one is there. By this point, my suspicions have kind of got my anxiety heightened. I'm a researcher, after all, and part of my training involves knowing when you're stepping on people's toes. I could sense that when I ran into Dr. Gomez earlier today. I'm wondering if maybe there's something bigger here than I realized. I hear some movement at the front door. I get up and slowly make my way over to it. Through the gap at the bottom, I see someone's shadow. Then it walks away. Footsteps recede. Soon it is silent. I don't open the door right away, but when I feel it's safe, I check outside. A strange item is lying on the ground, but I'm not sure what I'm looking at at first. Looks like a kind of homemade doll, but it is not. It's actually a handful of sticks, all sharpened to a point, each six inches long, tied together with a piece of twine. About to pick it up, when I realize that a couple of the sticks are actually bones. I don't know much about anatomy, but it looked like maybe a forearm bone, like an ulna, that had been snapped into places and bound up with the rest of the sticks. This weird little bundle also has writing all over it. Look closer. They're not words, but ideograms or hieroglyphs. Some of the characters actually resemble Chinese. I'm describing all of this just to give you an image, but the most important thing is what was underneath. Hard to tell in the dark, but I'm pretty sure it was a pool of blood. I heard movement again, and I looked around. I could not see much of anything. Decided to leave the thing there. Go back inside. Figure I'll tell my colleague before we leave the house the next morning, so she does not freak out. I do this, but when I show her the item, it's gone. My colleague thinks I'm playing a trick on her. I insist that I saw what I described to you. She has a hard time believing me. Understandable. There isn't even a stain where I said I saw blood. In the end, she just shrugs and says we should forget about it. Fast forward. The two weeks are over. We're preparing to leave. In the end, I never discovered why the locals were frightened of the hospital. Since they changed their tune, I could not even mention it in my policy recommendation. So I wrote some report on cultural competency, urging the scientific community to engage with locals one-on-one -on -one in the hopes that something would come to light. I never heard anything more on the matter. But I talked to my colleague a few months later. I brought up the weird item. She said she'd been meaning to tell me something. That morning, when I told her about the item, afterwards, we'd resumed our work, visiting dozens of locals. She was especially eager to finish up our final report. But during that time, in a few different houses, she noticed items like the one I described to her. 
Some were pretty different, but some were almost identical. She saw clumps of dirt and moss tied together. Sticks tied together with twine, sharpened to a point. Some had writing, some did not. When these objects did have writing, she noticed it looked like Chinese, or like hieroglyphs, exactly like I had described to her. Of course she was struck by this, but she was pretty consumed with the wrap-up process since we were nearing the end of our stay. Plus, it just did not seem relevant to our report. Still, she jotted down notes about these items just in case. Later, after we left, she looked over her notes and made a weird discovery. These items were all concentrated within a specific area. Every single household was sitting more or less in the perimeter of the hospital, a big circle all the way around. She believed this was likely a coincidence. I still don't know what to think. Hello Anons, how was your sleep? I had a dream about dreaming. In it, I was following a documentary of sorts which went as follows. When you dream, your imaginary field of vision is divided into three parts. Left field, right field, and central field. These fields are perceived differently by the brain. Left and right fields act as a background of sorts. For example, if your dream takes place in a forest, you will see a faint image of trees on the edge of your vision. The central field is by far the most important, as it contains the topic of your dream, stuff you're focused on, and your brain has to process this the most. Central field is always last to appear when falling asleep, and first to disappear when waking up. It's crucial in the process of waking up. Throughout the dream, you weren't really aware of the fields. Your brain processes them subconsciously and kind of expects them to be there, but sometimes one of them is not. In the vast majority of cases, you will form all three fields. In result, you will end up with mostly normal dreams, which can be pleasant, unpleasant, and everything in between. There is, however, a small chance that one of your side fields does not form. Throughout your dream, the brain knows that something is not right, but can't figure out what. In result, you feel uneasy and stressed out throughout your whole dream. It does not cause nightmares. More like your normal dreams become sadder and more strenuous because of this primal sense of unease. But this is not the worst that could happen by a long shot since shit really hits the fan when your central field goes missing. It happens very rarely, much rarer than the disappearance of side fields. Your brain does not know what's going on or what to do. It only sees the background of the side fields. In an attempt not to break down, it desperately fills up the center field based on the information contained within the background. The results are nightmarish, kinda like what you get from these AI face drawing generators, but much weirder. This weird shit becomes the main topic of your dream, but it's not a normal dream since there is no proper central field, just the background and central field mockup. It doesn't have structure or even wacky dream logic. It's just a cacophonic mess. Brain that was already in panic mode freaks out, but it cannot stop drawing the central field. Brain freaks out even more. This death cycle continues, with the brain getting more and more paranoid. Since there is no proper central part, you cannot wake yourself up. The person having a dream is engulfed in feelings of raw terror, psychosis, and hopelessness, from which one cannot escape. The documentary proceeds to show a simulation of what it's like. I see all three fields. On the side, there's a boring landscape of grass and grey sky. In the middle, I see a weird mashup of these elements combined with some others that the background did not have. I was sure I could see a black outline of a person in this jumbled mess. As the lecturer said, began feeling very uneasy. All I hear is intrusive, unbearable buzzing, kind of like a fly that flew in your ear and got trapped. Buzzing gets louder and louder. Wake up. To provide some backstory, I'm 19. I live in New South Wales, Australia, up in the Blue Mountains. I moved into this house about a few months ago. My dad and I 
or DIY people, and the house needed a few improvements. But there were some awesome features about this house. One of which that seemed awesome at first, but I've now come to hate, is the fact that we live on the corner of our street, and our house borders on hundreds, hectares, of national park. I myself love the outdoors, hiking, rock climbing, you name it. I've pretty much lived out in the bush since I was a kid. We have fixed up a whole bunch of the house, and stuff is going well, but there is still plenty of work to go. The first paranormal experience I had up here was about three weeks ago, although this was the least eerie of the things that I have experienced. It was about five o'clock. My dad, a close family friend and I, were sitting down on the porch, sharing a beer, after a long day of working on the house. Let's call my family friend Dave. Nine o'clock rolls around, and Dave heads off for the night. Me and my dad sit around until about 11, just chatting about life in general. Dad heads inside, and I decide to stay outside and finish my beer. Now, it's dead quiet around my house, so this caught me off guard. I hear rustling in the bushes, moving from left to right in my yard at a speed unimaginable by any creature that lives near me. This obviously scares me a bit, because holy fucking shit, it was fast. My yard is about 40 meters wide, and it covered it in about 5 seconds. It startled me. I assumed it was probably a low-flying bat, and that there was nothing to be worried about. At the far corner of my yard, I heard a noise that I can only describe as pure terror. I can't see the bottom of my yard, as it's covered in bush, and just out of the porch light's reach, so I was not able to see it at that point in time. This noise could be described as a slow, creaking noise, but it was being made by something that was alive, almost like it had an extremely dry throat and was trying to make a scream. Everything about this noise was wrong. I was frozen in fear. I literally could not move. Eventually, I decided on leaving my beer, standing up slowly and walking back inside. The noise stopped when I went inside, or at least I was unable to hear it for a while. I walked into my room, turned on my fan, kicked off my shoes, and climbed into bed. Now I don't usually sleep with my fan on, because sometimes it fucks up and makes a loud ass noise, but it was hot. About 30 minutes later, my fan turned off, and my phone stopped charging. I decided it was probably just some electrical fault due to the work on the house earlier that day. I called it a night, and tried to get some rest. The day after I woke up, had my breakfast, and tried to turn on my TV, but it refused to turn on. I get up fairly early, around 7, so the rest of my family was asleep. I went outside to check the circuit breaker, and it had been pried open by something large, and the main power switch had been turned off. This fucking scared me. It was then I remembered the noises from the previous night, and something felt so wrong about all of this. I went back inside to talk to my dad about it. Dad woke up around 9, I told him immediately, and he said he would check it out, and that I needed to calm down, as the power might have been tripped. I then went on to explain the way that the metal case surrounding it had been opened by a crowbar or something. Dad went out to check, and he was pretty concerned about it. That was pretty much the end of it. We never really did anything about it, which would prove to be really stupid later on. A few days go past, and nothing out of the ordinary happens. It was late at night on a Friday, and I generally have my mates over for a get-together, so we were all sitting around on the porch, chatting about guy shit, when the fucking bushes rustled from right to left at the front of my yard, like it did a few days earlier. I started shitting it, and explained what happened to my mates. Let's call my friends Matt, John, Paul, and Ray. Matt is a frequent ex-user, and believes in spirits, ghosts, demons, the usual spooky stuff. Matt works as a plumber, and drove his ute here. Him and Paul drive the ute down to the backyard so that they can use their high beams to see what it was. Me, John, and Ray sit around and try to see what it was, but pretty much just end up staying quiet. John speaks up. Probably a fox or some shit, man. Me and Ray both spend a lot of time in the outdoors and explain that there is no way that a fox moved through that thick bush so quickly. We stop our bickering as we can hear an engine start in the distance. Matt drives his ute around and turns on his high beams. This was the first time I saw it. The engine stopped, and I looked over at the car. About five meters from the front of the car, 
was a white, pale figure, no taller than five feet, that had arms so long they touched the ground. Everyone was shocked, silent as anything. I looked over at the others, trying to figure out what the fuck we were going to do. The figure looked like its jaw was unhinged from its face. Literally every human quality it had was mangled in some way. Its face did not look like it had eyes. Everything about it filled me with disgust. Car engine starts again. The figure disappears within an instant, and the ute reverses as fast as it can. We could hear whatever it was running into the bush at its insane speed. Years ago, camping alone, remote area, not sure that I'm not the first human being to set foot in here in at least a century. Get the fire going. Hear a twig snap. Worried it's a cougar or a coyote. Retrieve my AR-15. Set it on the log next to me. Toss more logs on the fire. Twig snaps again. Look at where I heard the sound. See eyes reflecting the firelight. They're fucking six feet off the ground. Owl? Cougar perched in a tree, bear on its hind legs, aim super bright, surefire, at eyes, and turn it on. Trees are lit up like it's day. Nothing is there. Turn light off. Eyes are there, blinking rapidly like the light hurt its eyes. Shine light at them again. Nothing. Turn light off. Eyes blink rapidly again, then retreat into the trees can hear the brush rustling as it moves. What the fuck? Cradle, rifle, and lap. Toss more logs on the fire. Hear leaves crunching behind me. Fuck. It circled around me. Spin around. Shine my flashlight. Nothing is fucking there but trees and bushes. Turn light off. Eyes blink rapidly, then stare steadily at me. Nope. Climb into Bronco. Lock all the doors. Sleep in back seat with rifle in my arms. Wake up the next morning. My tent is collapsed. Something or someone pulled up all the tent pegs and pushed it over. Fuck this campsite, dot jpeg. Move to a different area two miles away. This place is full of boulders and near a dry creek bed. Set up camp at the base of a boulder half as big as my house. Build new fire pit. Start fire. Stack firewood. Oh yeah cooking chili tonight. Hear bush rustling. Damn it, that better be a fucking possum. Click safety off of my rifle. Look all around. There's the eyes again. Six feet off of the ground. Shen flashlight. Nothing there. Light off. Eyes blink rapidly, then move. Eyes are beginning to circle the fire, rustling and snapping twigs as they move. Shine light repeatedly. Wiggle it around. Get up and move around, trying to see whatever it is. Nothing. All I can see are the eyes reflecting my campfire, and only when the flashlight is off. Watching eyes warily, start creeping towards my bronco. Twig snaps behind me. Spin. See eyes in the tree behind me. Fuck. There are two of them. I've got a gun. Quit fucking around and come out where I can see you. No response. Eyes continue circling camp, crunching, rustling, and snapping. Fuck this. Fire a shot at the ground, roughly where one of the feet should be. Both pair of eyes stop and blink a few times. Eyes stand side by side, then disappear like whatever they were turned away from me. Hear them crunching through brush, heading deeper into the woods, away from me. Get into Bronco and lock all the doors again. Don't want to pack my stuff, because that involves setting my rifle down and turning my back to those things. Don't want to drive off without my stuff either. Settle for sitting in the car. Sitting up all night in case they come back. Fall asleep sometime around 4am. Wake up at sunrise. My tent is shredded, and the aluminum poles are bent. Sleeping bag is 20 feet away from camp. I'm partially buried under a pile of leaves. Something pulled my pot off the fire and ate my chili. Nope. Pack my shit and get the fuck out of Dodge. One month later, tell friends about the creepy eyes in the woods. 
They all think that we should go and find out what they are. Maybe it's Bigfoot. Decide that we should load for bear. Friend 1 brings his fowl in 1911. Friend 2 brings AK-47 and .357 Magnum. Friend 3 is poor, brings Mossberg shotgun. I bring an AR-15 and CZ-75B 9mm. Friend 1's dad says he wants to go too, mostly to keep us out of trouble, and brings his Marlin .4570 and .404 Magnum along. Loans friend free another 9mm. Set up camp at Boulder's site. Show them around. Get the fire going. Friend's dad breaks out a bottle of Jägermeister, and we all share a drink. Just one though. He doesn't want us armed and drunk. Swap spooky stories to get in the mood and discuss Bigfoot documentary on History Channel. Debate why the hell the History Channel has a documentary on Bigfoot. Suddenly, hear a loud twig snap. Look around. Spot eyes six feet off the ground again. Everybody shines flashlights simultaneously. Nothing there. Turn lights off. Eyes blink rapidly. Dude, it, it's just like you said. Everybody takes turns shining lights and waving them around. I start circling the camp, crunching through the brush. How come we can't see anything when we shine our lights? Sudden crashing noise. He rocks sliding and falling. Another pair of eyes blinks on top of the huge boulder, then drops to the ground with a loud thump. Shine lights. Nothing. I start circling camp like the first set. Friends dad. Fuck this shit. Rock and roll. Mad minute. Everyone fires every round in their rifles and shotguns at the eye, then switches to pistols and keeps shooting when their rifles run empty. Reload. Ears are ringing. Shine lights. See nothing but trees full of bullet holes. Turn the lights off. Both pairs of the eyes are gone. Search the woods with flashlights. Don't find any tracks. Find something like blood on the ground. Looks black under our flashlights. Find nothing else. Feel stupid and crawl into friend one's dad's huge army tent. Chatter in our sleeping bags. Agree that we were dumbasses for shooting like maniacs when we didn't even know what our targets were. No one will admit that we were scared like little bitches, and that's why we shot. Finally wear off the adrenaline and fall asleep. Wake up. Something is rustling outside the tent. Slide pistol out of holster and loudly snap the safety off. Nearly shit my heart out when a hand clamps over my pistol and the hand holding it. It's friend one's dad. Shh. It's right outside. Don't move. Slides out of sleeping bag and stands up. Oh shit, whatever it is, it's rubbing against the tent because the tent wall is bowed in towards us. Friend's dad carefully steps over friend free to get closer to that side of the tent. Where's his gun? Suddenly stabs into the side of the tent with the biggest fucking bowie knife I've ever seen. Something that sounds like a cross between a bear that just got kicked in the balls and a pissed off elephant screams. The entire side of the tent collapses. The others wake up and start yelling. Friend's dad is shouting, Don't shoot! Don't shoot! He's afraid that we're going to shoot each other in a panic. Finally pile out of the tent and start frantically waving flashlights and guns in all directions. Nothing. It's dead silent. Me, friends two and three, pile into my bronco. Friend one and his dad get into their suburban. Stay up as long as we can. We all fell asleep. Five guys hyped up on panic and adrenaline, and we all fell asleep. Wake up shortly after sunrise. Tent is collapsed, but has not been tampered with. Ice chest is flipped on its side, and the contents are spilled. The only things missing are a package of lunch meat, all of our beef jerky, we brought a lot, and the bottle of Jaeger. Fuck this, we're going home. Stop packing. Friend's dad finds his knife in the tent. It's covered in blood so dark it's almost black. He nubs, cleans it off, and keeps packing. We haul ass out of there and stop at a diner for breakfast. Waiting for waitress to bring us our food. Try puzzling out what the hell it was that we encountered out there. Friend 2. Wait, the meat makes sense. But why the hell did it steal the Jaeger? Since then, I've spent a lot of time in the woods. It's kind of my job and seen some weird, creepy shit, including things very similar to this encounter. 
I don't freak out about it now, and I'm not going to fire panic shots into the dark or anything like that, but I do have a healthy respect for whatever is out there, and I don't go into the wilderness without a gun. Period. There is some seriously bizarre, unexplainable shit out there. Stay safe. Live off deep in the holler. Drive out to one of my backward spots to go camping. Three hours into a five hour hike before I reach my camping spot. Nice day. Fresh air. Clear skies. Occasional animal noises in the distance. Getting that oneness feel with nature. Hear some rustling up a hill off the path that I am treading. It's a fucking dude. He's stumbling down the hill. He's walking funny, like a puppet on strings walk. Very weird looking. My memory kicks in. There were no other cars parked in the offshoot that leads to the forest trail that I'm treading. We are on the edge of fucking nowhere. There is nothing out there for hundreds of miles from the direction that he came from. It's just fucking forests. That's when he started to laugh and called out, Hello there. That's when I unholstered my gun. This dude stumbles onto the trail. He has a real jovial demeanor about him. I rack the side. Gen 1, SNW, MMP. No safety. He waves as he walks towards me on the trail. I aim at this guy and yell, That's close enough. The dude is completely unfazed, with me pointing a gun at him. He just keeps laughing and waving. Weird ass gait to his walk. Almost serpentine swivel to his legs, but his body did not move right, like puppet strings were moving him. It was uncanny as fuck. I've heard enough stories about things in the woods from X and other places to know how this shit goes down. I will fucking kill you. I am not fucking around. I say this really fast and loud. If there is any semblance of sanity in this creature, I want them to know that they will soon be ventilated. Undeterred, he keeps wiggle walking towards me. This is after I pointed a gun at him and threatened to shoot this motherfucker. I can clearly discern his facial features. He looked normal enough. You'd be forgiven for mistaking him for a human, for sure, if it wasn't for that weird ass walk. He was wearing a sweater and jeans. Just a regular dude by any other account. Said dude is less than 10 meters away at this point, and he continues with the laugh and disjointed conversation stutters. It's nice to meet ya. Internal monologue goes fuck it, and I dump 5 or 6 rounds of 40 into this guy. I pause for a moment because he stops walking after those shots. I think I hit him. He wasn't bleeding though. He didn't scream or wince or anything. He just stood there. Then he falls. He settles in an awkward position, like his joints and bones are not connected right. It's like someone put human together without knowing how a skeletal structure works. Swear to God. Crinkle man contorted into a mess of shapes on the trail floor. Zipped off like a fucking bird and disappears into the underbrush. I hear a rapid pitter-patter of steps that gradually fade into the fucking woods with twigs and branches snapping as Crinkle Man gets further away. I noped out of there hard. It was already 2.30, and by 4.30, it's gonna be getting dark in the forest. Darker than I'd feel comfortable being with Crinkle Man out there. On the spot, I dumped my tent, sleeping bag, and everything. I was okay just leaving it there because I needed to turn a three hour hike into an hour and a half hike. There was no fucking way I was going to get caught in the forest after dark with fucking crinkle man wriggle walking up to my ass. Fuck that. With the bare essentials on my person, I double timed it back the way I came. Luckily, it was mostly downhill, so I was not fighting gravity like when I came up. I took care not to run too fast because if I twisted my ankle, or fell and hurt myself, I knew I would be well and truly fucked if Crinkle Man was creeping around. At 3.45, the sun was already starting not to show through the trees as much. A slight panic had started to get into me, but I remained calm and kept with my brisk pace. I got back to my car at fucking 4.20. I looked back into the forest, and apparently, my eyes had adjusted to it because it was dark as fuck. 20 meters back into it, and the shadows just created a cave-like darkness into the nevers of the underbrush. Got in my car and got the fuck out of there.
I don't know what that thing was, but it was not going to be wearing my skin. I don't know if that thing is still out there, but I don't camp in that neck of the woods now. I'm not going back for my tent or other kit. It's not worth it for that stretch of woods. What stretch of the woods? I'd go for that free tent. If you can go to the edge of the world at these coordinates, you'll find a spot to park your car along the way where the road ends, I'm sure. Peek around that spot and you'll see a path into the woods. Follow it and let it take you where it will. If you follow that path, it'll eventually take you to this lake at these coordinates. That was my original destination before the crinkle man intervened. The path to the lake is not a beeline and do not try to turn it into one. The trees will blend together and the forest will swallow you up if you stray from it, so stay the fuck on that path. I didn't try to hide my shit away, so if you don't come across it, there's a good chance someone got to that stash before you. That was about three years ago now. If it is still there, the weather might have worn it down a bit, but maybe you can salvage something. The path might branch a bit. If you encounter the three ponds at these coordinates, you've gone too far south. Where is the stash? I was in a panic when I ditched it, so I don't recall the exact location. Somewhere around here maybe. I know that doesn't seem that far, but the path winds up and down around hills and shit, and it'll lead around. Before I ran into Crinkle Man, I'd say the lake made for a good camping spot, but now, well, good luck, stalker. Not that guy, but please describe what happened after you shot him in more detail. You say he made off like a bird. I know it doesn't make sense, but that's the best way I can describe it. Maybe the way it moved made me think of a bird. I was pumped full of adrenaline at the time, so maybe my perception was fucky. A few seconds prior, I was under the impression I may just have killed a man. A weirdo for sure, but possibly a man. It was probably more the speed at which it took off from a seemingly prone position that gave me the bird impression. It reminded me of when you frighten a bird that you don't realize is there, and you hear that quick whip 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 of its wings, and it's gone a second later. That's not the sound it made, but that's the association my brain made with its movement. It didn't fly though, it just moved really fast and disappeared into the brush. The whole encounter of it coming down the hill, me pointing my gun and shooting it, and the thing disappearing into the woods, did not last more than a minute total. Probably less. It did not spend that much time on the ground crumpled up. Maybe a few seconds before it darted off. When I shot it, or believed to have shot it, like I said, it did not react how you would expect it to. It stopped, stood there for a few seconds, and then it crumpled into its crinkle form. No cry, no wince, no shudder. Just an unmoving mass, like someone snipped the strings on a marionette and then it was gone. Now that I recall, on my hike back to the car, the forest was dead silent. That's because you fired a gun, dumbass. I mean, maybe, but for the whole hour and a half hike back, no birds singing, no bugs chirping, just pure fucking silence in those woods. It was like a completely different forest on the way back to my car. As it got closer to four in the afternoon, my vision was slowly being whittled away by the ever-decreasing light slipping in from the setting sun. It wasn't that great before, but at certain points, I could not see more than 20 feet around me. Everything beyond that range just melted into a murky blackness of foliage and underbrush. The whole way back, I had a strong desire to just run like hell, but I knew I'd have a trip, get lost, or end up winding myself and having to rest. I had no choice but to tread quickly but carefully and make good time back to my car. All I could do was follow the trail. I'd look behind me every so often and expect that thing to be there, creeping up on me, but there was never anything back there. That was for the best, I think. I don't know what I would have done if that creeper showed up behind me on my hack back. I think I would have broke nervous and bolted in a panic, probably would have gone off the trail and got lost in the underbrush. I don't want to think about what might have happened after all of that. So my cousin has learned his lesson about never fucking driving loads without a gun, and he ends up needing that gun in another story I could tell. It's not really paranormal per se, but if people are into hearing it, I'll write it up. He's also learned, like a lot of drivers do, that the real money is out west, driving long ass holes to various padunk old mining towns, still trying to stay alive in the mountains or the desert. That's big open, unforgiving country, and there aren't many people willing to, and or capable of, driving across it for 12 hours, trying to beat a deadline. 
there are even fewer drivers you can count on to do it consistently, since just about all the ones willing to do it in the first place are souped up a meth, coke, or whatever the fuck else will keep them up long enough to see a delivery through to completion. My cousin, as we've established, is clean, and has been for a long fucking time. He's a hard worker, he's desperate for cash, and he's got a good van. He doesn't make excuses, and he doesn't get pulled over driving loads of shit that he has not weighed. All this means that my cousin is a very in-demand man, and what's more, it means that he ends up doing a lot of high-leverage jobs. Jobs that need to be done quickly and correctly, and as such, jobs that pay very, very well. Our second story begins with my uncle being asked to do such a job. A good, trustworthy dispatcher is a client who needs a shitload of parts delivered to his business in Flagstaff for an order that needs to be assembled and sent off ASAP. They need the parts by tomorrow. Problem is, my uncle is in Denver, and that's an 11-hour drive through hard mountains and desert. Making matters worse, the load is technically too heavy for his van. The client is desperate, however, and the dispatcher is willing to pay a ludicrous amount of money to get these things there on time. I'm talking $3,000 for 11 hours of work, with gas paid for. So fine. My cousin, sorry, called him uncle in the last post. I've always called him Uncle Bill, since he's so much older than me. I can assure you that he is in fact my cousin, and not my uncle. Hooks up with the dispatcher, and they load the van as full as it's ever been. If a cop pulls him over, my cousin is fucked. He sets out plenty early, after a full night's rest, unlike the NC incident. Most of the drive is uneventful, though a cop does pull alongside my cousin in UT, and eyes him suspiciously, before peeling off to pull over a speeder. My cousin heads south through Navajo Nation, just as the sun begins to set. This is his first time in the nation, and he's going in with the darkness. Yes, you do know where this is going. It's creepy out there, in the middle of nowhere, my cousin says. He happens to get just the most beautiful night. Stars as far as the eye can see, and he feels like his van could just lift right off that old-ass highway and float through them. He's passing the time pleasantly enough, Thinking back to the time spent on the reservation, back in the Midwest, when something catches the corner of his eye. Black blurs, flitting along the very edge of his brights, off to the left and way far ahead. He turns his head as he drives past, but of course, he can't see anything, since it's dark as hell. But the shapes persist. He rubs his eyes, shakes his head, and tries to refocus on the road, but they are still there. He's gone several miles now, but the shapes are staying in front of him. He wonders if there's something wrong with his headlights. Maybe a dead bug on one of them. There's a long, flat patch of desert, illuminated by the moon, and he gets his first good look. Wolves? Maybe a quarter of a mile directly to the left of his car. Nah, one wolf, running weirdly but keeping up with him. As soon as he thinks this, the wolf starts to lag behind a bit, and he has to deliberately remind himself to pay attention to the road so that he does not veer off of it. But when he checks back, the wolf is still lingering, still a quarter mile off, still shuffling weirdly, about perpendicular to his blind spot. He is losing it. He decides, no fucking way, right? But the wolf keeps going, and then something happens, my cousin says, which he will never forget. He doesn't like to tell the story, or any story really. He's a quiet dude, and in fact, only told me after we had seen one another, for the first time in over a year, and after we had been up all night at a family event, but he swears it's true. Disturbed, he checks for cops and bumps his van up to 80 miles per hour, trying to leave the fucking weird-ass cheetah wolf behind. For a second, it seems like the wolf is fully behind him, and he is satisfied. But then, the hair on the back of his neck stands up, and he breaks out into a cold sweat. Something twitches in the corner of his eye. He looks over his shoulder, it's the fucking wolf. It's keeping up with him again. Only this time, it's running on its hind legs. My cousin takes a double take, eyes bugging out of his fucking head, and floors it. Then the wolf takes an angle of pursuit. He's frantically looking over his shoulder now, and back at his speedometer, hardly glancing at the road. The wolf is drawing closer, even as my cousin pushes the pedal down. Before too long, the wolf is running on the edge of the road. Then, Slowly, it starts to veer across the other lane. 
about a mile ahead, my cousin sees two big headlights barreling down the opposite lane. He decides he is going to do everything in his power to make sure that the semi hits the fucking wolf because he is in full on fucking adrenaline fueled panic. Gulping, sweating so badly his hands are slipping on the wheel, breathing loudly through his mouth. The wolf keeps inching closer. Finally, my cousin flat out floors it with everything he's got. The engine whines, straining against the heavy load. The semi barrels towards them, and in the instant before the semi hits the wolf, blaring its horn as loudly as it can, the wolf is right next to my cousin's driver's side window. I've never heard Bill lie before. This is what he says happened. I don't know what to believe. It presses its body flat against its car, and it stretches into black shadow. Eventually, he swears, it takes on a humanoid form with exaggerated facial features that it presses against its window. As the semi blazes past, it smashes its huge eyes and Cheshire Cat grin flat against his window, to the point where it fogs up on the outside. He can't tear his eyes from its eyes. It's the most malicious smile he's ever seen, and something feels wrong. Icy cold, in the very core of him. Once the semi is past, the thing leaps away, shrieking with ear-splitting laughter and perching on a nearby rock. My cousin can hardly breathe, and he vomits into the seat next to him and continues to floor it. The thing stays behind, screaming and gasping with laughter. He makes it to the drop, still fucking cold and nauseous. He can't look the client in the eye. He smells like vomit, and he tells the client the story. Again, Bill's a very quiet and very private dude. He must have been shaken to say anything about the shit to a stranger. The client is certain that he's drunk, and my cousin never delivers for him or drives through the nation again. At the urging of one of the workers of the client's warehouse, Kurz goes to see a Navajo medicine man who brushes him with feathers and gives him a blessing. My cousin pukes again and feels right as rain. And that's the story of the time my cousin met a skinwalker.